Hello everyone, hope you're doing good and hope you're making the best of your uh, time at home. Uh, this is Dr. Guru and I'll be your tutor for orthodontics. Uh, uh, we haven't met each other face to face and let's hope we're going to do so in uh, the near future. Anyway, for today's virtual lecture, I will be covering uh, the first part of cephalometrics which includes the introduction to cephalometrics and also we will cover the landmarks and planes utilized in cephalometrics. Um, at the end of this lecture, you should be able to define and describe the advantages and disadvantages of cephalometrics. You should also be able to describe the anatomical landmarks and various angles used in orthodontics. And finally, you should be able to differentiate the skeletal malocclusion from dental malocclusion types. So these will be your learning outcomes. So let's begin with uh, the introduction to cephalometrics. Cephalo means head and metrics is to measure. So when you bring these words together, it's measurement of head, cephalometrics. So salesman describes cephalometrics as a science which includes measurements, description, and appraisal of the morphological configuration and growth changes in the skull by ascertaining the dimension of lines, angles, and planes between anthropometric landmarks established by physical anthropologists and points selected by orthodontists. So basically, it's a, a, a science which involves two streams. One is anthropology and the other one is or orthodontics. Uh, so based on this uh, and the classical work of uh, broadband and Hofrit uh, led to the development of a cephalostat. That is the machine used to take a cephalogram and led to the beginning of cephalometric tracing and analysis and became a part of orthodontic diagnosis and treatment planning. So coming to the uses of cephalogram, uh, it is used in orthodontic diagnosis uh, by enabling the study of skeletal, dental and soft tissue structures of the craniofacial region. This is important as uh, before uh, you treat a particular patient and before it a final diagnosis is made, you need to have a clear understanding of where the malocclusion state is occurring from, whether it's skeletal, dental, or from soft tissue structures, or it's a combination of one or more of these. And uh, the next use will be in classifying the skeletal and dental abnormalities and to establish different facial types. It can also help you to establish a relationship between the maxillary and mandibular base, uh, thereby determining the type of uh, growth and its uh, uh, future predictions. Uh, uh, cephalometrics helps uh, to a major extent in treatment planning and also provides a guidance to an orthodontist or uh, a clinician to understand if a particular individual only needs orthodontic correction or needs surgical correction or a bit of both. And um, it also will help you to evaluate both the pre and post treatment results. Um, further, it can help you in research involving the cratio, uh, sorry, uh, cranio dentofacial region and also for record keeping uh, and uh, to avoid any uh, malpractice or medical legal cases. So what are the limitations of a cephalogram? As with any x-ray, there's always a chance of a radiation hazard and hence uh, you have to be mindful of the number of times you want to expose the patient and the number of uh, x-rays or the set of x-rays you want to do on a particular patient. And there's also the limitation of image enlargement and distortion. So the distortion basically uh, can be because of the overlying uh, or overlapping uh, soft tissues and hard tissue structures of the craniofacial region. 
and also the other uh, limitation is uh, a cephalogram is only a 2d representation of a 3d structure that is a three-dimensional uh, structure within the craniofacial region is seen as a two-dimensional structure so this is a huge limitation uh, because certain points might not be easily discernible uh, and then the other uh, problems or limitations associated are the technique sensitivity that is you have to learn how to work uh, the machine how to process the x-rays and how to uh, perform the diagnosis uh, sorry how to perform the cephalometric analysis once the x-ray has been developed and so on uh, and all these uh, uh, finally will add up to the amount of time you are spending on a particular patient that is right from the time you've exposed the patient to a x-ray and uh, the time you reach a diagnosis or a treatment planning it takes a bit of time to navigate between these various processes so basically uh, there are two types of cephalograms you will come across one is a lateral cephalogram which provides a lateral view of the skull and another one is called a frontal cephalogram or a posterior anterior cephalogram which provides an anterior posterior view so uh, under normal uh, circumstances a lateral uh, cephalogram is what suffices uh, in most of the cases and it will aid uh, diagnosis and treatment planning but if you were to look for certain uh, abnormalities like facial asymmetry or uh, certain uh, uh, congenital anomalies so then you'll have to subject the patient to a posterior anterior uh, cephalogram as well here you see a cephalostat or an orthopontomogram uh, machine uh, basically, it has four uh, major components. One is the X-ray source. Uh, the next one is the adjustable cephalostat, a film cassette, and a film cassette holder. So the film cassette can either be a conventional film-based one or a phosphoplate imaging. Um, here you can see how a cephalogram is taken and uh, what is the physics behind it. Uh, the distance between the x-ray source and the mid sagittal plane of the patient is always fixed at 5 feet. So this is to prevent excessive uh, magnification and avoid excessive distortion. And this has also another advantage of standardizing the successive uh, ref, uh, radiographs you take on the same patient. So you're able to compare pre-treatment and post-treatment, and you're also able to compare changes occurring as part of growth. So uh, basically the patient's head is immobilized in the cephalostat with the mid sagittal plane of the head parallel to the film. Uh, once a cephalogram is exposed and developed, there are uh, basically two ways or methods of uh, tracing a cephalogram. So the first method is uh, a hand tracing method, which you will be performing. So the image on the top uh, uh, shows how uh, cephalogram uh, is being traced. Uh, so basically, uh, all you need is a lateral cephalogram or a posterior anterior cephalogram, uh, an acetate mat tracing paper, some pencils, a protractor, a dental cast, uh, a good view box, and some silicone tape. So when you actually are uh, uh, doing the hands-on exercise, so you'll be able to better understand how exactly you're going to use all these to trace a uh, cephalogram. Um, a easier and a more advanced way of tracing a cephalogram is using the computerized tracing method. Uh, wherein you use uh, a commercially available uh, software such as Onyxep or uh, Dolphin. Uh, this uh, basically uh, you upload uh, a digital uh, cephalogram onto the software and then you're able to construct uh, angles, you're able to locate landmarks, you're able to identify landmarks and perform all sorts of uh, analysis using uh, this particular software. However, uh, at your uh, current stage, you will be 
doing a hand tracing method. If there is enough time, maybe we will get a chance to try out the uh, Onyx set. We'll see. So once you have uh, decided to trace a cephalogram, there are uh, various landmarks you have to be aware of. So mm, uh, let's divide them into anatomical landmarks. Uh, which are uh, landmarks representing the actual anatomical structures of the skull. And these can be hard tissue landmarks or soft tissue landmarks. And the next type is uh, derived landmarks. These are landmarks which are uh, obtained secondarily or constructed from the anatomical landmarks. Probably we'll be discussing more in depth about these in the uh, discussion in cephalometric uh, part two. Uh, the image here uh, represents the heart tissue landmarks, which you will be uh, learning about. Uh, so basically, all these landmarks are the ones you have to know. You have to be in a position to identify them. You have to be in a position to locate them on a cephalogram and also describe uh, briefly what areas or what anatomical points they represent. All right, so the next few slides, uh, we will uh, go into the details of each of these landmark points. So to start with, uh, we will learn a bit about glabella. Uh, the glabella is the most prominent point on the anterior contour of the frontal bone. So if you're able to position and identify frontal bone on a lateral cephalogram, then you can easily discern where a glabella is. Okay, so it's at the anterior contour of the frontal bone. The next point is nasion. The most anterior point of the frontonasal suture in the median plane. So for this, you should be in a position to identify where is the frontonasal suture and its ideal location. So that's the suture which is between the frontal bone and the nasal bone, which is at the root of the nasal bone, right? Anterior nasal spine. So this is the tip of the bony anterior nasal spine in the medial plane. So the red dot shows the exact location of the anterior nasal spine, which is the tip of the bony anterior nasal spine. Point A, the point in the deepest midline concavity on the anterior maxilla. So look at anterior maxilla and look for the deepest concavity and that will be your point A. Prostion. So prostion, you have to look at the lowest and the most anterior point on the alveolar portion of the maxilla between the upper central incisors. So locate upper central incisors and locate the alveolar tip. That will give you prostion. And point B. Point B is at the deepest concavity on the mandibular symphysis. So if you're able to locate where mandibular symphysis is, then look at the deepest concavity there and you will be able to identify point B. Pogonian. Pogonian is at the anterior most point of bony chin. So again, if you're able to identify where uh, symphysis is. So look at the most anterior point of that bony part, that is the bony chin, and you will be able to identify pogonium. Menton. Again, you have to identify where is the mandibular symphysis. And once you've identified where is the mandibular symphysis, you locate the most inferior midline point the most inferior midline point of the mandibular symphysis will give you menton. Gnathion. So to identify Gnathion, you can do it two ways. 
first way is to find the most anterior inferior point on the symphysis of the chin. The most anterior inferior point on the symphysis of the chin. Not just the anterior, but anterior inferior, which is below pogonium. All right. Or else you can construct this by first identifying pogonium and then menton. And then you will draw a line joining these two points. Once you have constructed this line, construct a intersecting line perpendicular to this line. And that will give you the location of Pogonian. And that can be seen on the image which is on the right hand side. Uh, the next point is intradentale. Uh, look at the mandibular central incisors and then find the highest and the most anterior point on the alveolar process. So you look for the mandibular central incisors and you look for the alveolar process. The highest and most anterior point on the alveolar process will give you intradentate. Gonian. So Gonian is a constructed point on the ramus of the mandible. Uh, why is this a constructed point? Because the ramus has a medial surface and a lateral surface. It's a bilateral structure, right? So you have to find the midpoint between these two surfaces. Uh, another easier way to identify this point is to locate the angle of the mandible and you will be able to find this point. It can also be easily constructed by uh, having a line at the ramus plane and one line at the mandibular plane. So the intersection between the ramus plane and the mandibular plane will give you gonion. Uh, now coming to cella. So cella you're all aware it's uh, where the pituitary gland is located within the cellar tertica. So the point which is at the midpoint of the pituitary fossa or the cellar tertica will give you cella. Anatomical chorion. This is the superior most point of the external auditory meatus. So if you can locate where the external auditory meatus is on the image on the left or on the skull image on the right, you will be able to understand where exactly to locate this point. So find the superior most point of the external auditory meatus and that will give you anatomical chorion. Machine chorion. This is the top of the ear rod's shadows. Uh, uh, when the ear rods are placed in the external auditory meatus of a patient, the shadows of that are captured as well as a circular radio opaque structure on the lateral cephalogram. So the red dot is showing the circular radio opacity and the top portion of it, all right, is what you will call machine chorion. Basion, uh, the median point of the anterior margin of the foramen magnum. For this, if you're able to identify foramen magnum, then you find the anterior margin and the median point of the anterior margin will give you the exact location of basion. So it is the median point of the anterior margin of foramen magnum. Articular. This is the point of intersection of the images of the posterior border of the condyla process of the mandible and the inferior border of the basilar part of the occipital border. So if you can look at the image on the right hand side, you can see the condylar process and also you can see the basilar part of the occipital bone. So now look at the posterior border of the condylar process and also the lower arm or the inferior border. So wherever this inferior border bisects the condyle or the condyla process at the posterior surface is where you can identify and locate articulate. Hope that's clear. Orbital, uh, the lowest point in the inferior margin of the orbit or the midpoint between the right and left images. That is, as uh, we spoke about gonion, this too is a constructed point because there are right and left images and then you'll have to place a 
the point as a midpoint between the right and left images okay and this has to be at the lowest point in the inferior margin of the orbit and will give you r by t cherigo maxillary fissure it is a bilateral teardrop shaped area of radiolucency which represents the posterior surfaces of the maxillary tuberosity so here there are two ways of identifying one is to find the maxillary tuberosity and the other is to easily find the teardrop shaped area so if you find the, the teardrop shaped area of radiolucency then you uh, trace along the margins of it and there you have pterygo maxillary fissure posterior nasal spine so we've already understood where is uh, anterior nasal spine so this uh, is just the uh, other end of anterior nasal spine okay so this is the at the intersection of a continuation of the anterior wall of pterygo palatine fossa and the floor of the nose marking the dorsal surface of the maxilla at the level of the nasal floor so if you can e identify a cherigo maxillary fissure and the tip of the teardrop just below that will be posterior nasal spine all right so that's a uh, easier way of identifying this particular landmark and with this we will uh, uh, be completing the hard tissue landmarks now uh, the next slide onwards we will be discussing about uh, the soft tissue landmarks we shall now learn a bit on uh, the soft tissue landmarks so these points basically represent the soft tissue points of the underlying bony tissues or bony landmarks soft tissue pocornia uh, this is the most prominent point in the soft tissue contour of the chin uh, menton or soft tissue menton this is the constructed point of intersection of a vertical uh, coordinate from menton and the inferior soft tissue contour of the chin so you find the hard tissue menton and then extend a vertical line and uh, on to the soft tissue and you will be able to find soft tissue menton inferior label sulcus uh, the point of greatest concavity in the midline of the lower lip between labral uh, inferior and menton that is it is the point of greatest concavity in the midline of the lower lip between labral inferior and menton uh, this is labral inferior this is uh, the median point in the lower margin of the lower membranous lip the next point is labral superior uh, the median point in the upper margin of the upper membranous lip the next point is subnasal so the point where the lower part of the nose meets the outer contour of the upper lip so the point where the lower border of the nose meets the upper contour of the upper lip superior labial sulcus so the point of greatest concavity in the midline of the upper lip between subnasal and labral superior so if you can identify uh, subnasal the yellow point then you find the midline of the upper lip between the subnasal and labral superior so that's at the greatest concavity will be superior labial sulcus next point is pronasal the most prominent point of the nose soft tissue nasion the point of deepest concavity of the soft tissue contour of the root of the nose so this is just in front of nasion or it may be a little above or a little below depending on how the overlying soft tissue is contoured uh, soft tissue glabella, the most prominent point in the left sagittal plane of forehead. This too is exactly uh, in front of the hard tissue point. At times, it can be located a little above or below owing to the contour of the soft tissue. Now we are coming to the lines and planes of uh, cephalometrics. You can see facial, palatal, occlusal, mandibular y-axis, Bolton, uh, Frankfurt horizontal and so on. 
So basically, we will uh, describe a bit on the Frankfurt horizontal plane here. This is the plane intersecting right and left Borion and left orbital. So you are able to locate Borion, you are able to locate left orbital. So if you construct the line between these two, that becomes your Frankfurt horizontal plane or FH plane. It is drawn on the profile uh, Roentgenogram or photograph from the superior margin of the acoustic meatus to R by tail. The next plane is SN plane. Uh, this is a line joining the center of uh, Sela and Nation as seen on the profile Roentgenogram. The other plane is the occlusal plane. The occlusal plane uh, is a line drawn between the points representing one half of the incisor overbite and one half of the cusp height of the last occlusal molus. So it has to be a line between the incisor and one of the occluding molars. Next line or plane is the palatal plane. This is from anterior nasal spine to posterior nasal spine. Uh, next would be mandibular plane. Mandibular plane again can be constructed in two ways. One is from gonion to gnation and the other one is from gonion to menton. But on the image you are seeing gonion to gnation. A pogonian line, a vertical line drawn from point A and pogonian. Okay, this is on the heart tissue. Facial plane, a line drawn from nation to pogonian. Again, this is on the heart tissue. So with that, uh, we have completed several metrics part one. I hope you have uh, learned uh, the various landmarks, uh, where exactly you can find them, and why is it important to take a cephalogram, and how do you actually use a cephalogram in your day-to-day -day clinical care and practice. So. The next in series will be on cephalometrics part two. Uh, thank you for listening. I know cephalometrics and uh, uh, cephalometric analysis and cephalometric radiography is a little bit on the drier side of orthodontics, but uh, this also forms an essential part in diagnosis and treatment planning. Uh, it would be more interesting for you if you were doing it hands-on and we could have a more uh, interactive session. Hopefully, we're going to have that sometime soon. Till then, uh, I would uh, request you to go through and uh, uh, get to know your landmarks well. All right. Thank you so much for listening. Good luck.